Dr. Kimberly Quinn, a psychology professor at Chaplin College and TEDx speaker on ADHD, says clutter on the outside causes clutter on the inside. Research and my own clinical experience makes clear that ADHD can make it a challenge to stay organized, which can also cause clutter to pile up. Today, my guest is Wendy Zanders. She joins me to talk about clutter, the benefits of decluttering, and how to organize and declutter your space. Wendy is a declutter coach and professional organizer, and she is passionate about helping the special needs community take their homes and lives from overwhelmed to simplified. Millions of kids struggle with learning, processing, and social-emotional difficulties. These challenges interfere with their ability to reach their full potential. Dr. Karen Wilson is here to help. Her extensive background in pediatric neuropsychology and higher education have prepared her for this unique mission. Listen as she delivers content to inform, educate, and empower parents and educators. This will enable you to identify challenges that kids face and get them on the road to achieving their full potential. This is Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. Hi, Wendy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for this conversation. I know it's going to be amazing. It is going to be amazing. And like we were saying just before we went on, it's been a while since we connected. Pre-pandemic for sure. (laughs) It's been insane, but I'm so grateful to just kind of keep these connections going, whether you're local or you're international. I just love that we're able to connect through the airways. Absolutely. And I love it even more when we connect for a purpose, which is supporting kids who learn and think differently, kids who have, you know, a diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental disorder. And I know that you have really honed in on this community. And so you are here. And, you know, I, at the intro, I introduced kind of the topic of it. But I would love for you to, to talk about your journey, because you had undiagnosed ADD as a child. And now you help special needs families get organized. I'd love for you to talk about that journey Yes. So I am from Trinidad and Tobago and we moved to the United States when I was 14 years old. And even looking back at my time in um, back in Trinidad and Tobago, I was realizing that my parents, they had me in tutoring and the teacher, parent teacher conferences were Wendy can't even hear a pin drop. She was so distracted, but it was just me being nosy. At least, at least that's how they kind of summed it up. Okay, Wendy, focus, stop being so nosy, stop being everybody's business, focus on your schoolwork. And the way they um, kind of, my parents kind of went about it, it was just giving me more tutoring because I wasn't getting the information. And the more tutoring there was, the less I was retaining. So we just kind of stopped the tutoring and I was just able to just kind of flow through, just do my thing. I was a B student, you know, so I just, you know, the information just kind of came or it didn't. And that's just kind of how I kind of went through um, at least the first 14 years of my life. Moving here to America um, and just kind of being on the honor roll, I was able to find ways to learn. So I was doing the Pomodoro method before I even knew what that was. So I had a little sister who would say, you are always studying because my way of staying on the honor roll was to cram. So I was memorizing everything, holding the information in my brain. And then once that exam was done, don't ask me a single question. I have no idea. Right. But I got an A. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yes. So with her, it was, I said, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to study for 30 minutes And then I'm going to play two games of cards with you. And that's how I was, that's the Pomodoro method. So it was just so crazy that I was able to just kind of retain this this information. And then on Friday afternoons, I found myself cleaning and organizing my room as a way to de-stress. And I didn't realize that even now, that's how I function. When I'm high stressed and I'm just overwhelmed, I declutter. And it calms me down. So just kind of looking back at my childhood, realizing that's what I was doing. And I've applied it to my clients and um, just other ways of life. I joined the military when I was 17. um, And again, still undiagnosed ADHD. But because the military had that structure, I was able to thrive. I was able to memorize my, my general orders, memorize my ranks. And I'm very visual. So I'm able to 
hold the information in my brain and just be able to retain it that way. So just with the military, I did eight years in the military and just holding that structure has really helped me um, in all areas of my life. Um, Even when I'm working with clients, I always try to have a formula okay, we're decluttering a bedroom or we, or maybe somebody comes to me and say, my whole house is a mess <laughs> right. and I need support, but we always have to find that starting spot. I, I never recommend just kind of cherry picking throughout the house. That doesn't work. You really, because the thing is, if you do that, two hours will go by and you realize, oh my goodness, I am exhausted. And you look around and it, doesn't look and it feels like you made a bigger mess, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I always say, pick a room, pick a drawer, pick a cabinet, something. So w- when you do feel tired, you can look back and say, look at what I've gotten done. So you can kind of track your progress that way. Right. Now you help families identify, you know, what was created, what really has created the disorder in their lives. And you help them create systems so that they can get back in control of their home environment. And that is a struggle for many of the individuals that we work with. We know that for individuals with ADHD, there are often significant issues with executive functioning, which includes organization. And Dr. Kimberly Quinn, who I referenced at the, you know, when I was doing the intro to this episode, she has said that minimalism is the way to go for an overwhelmed executive functioning system. Yes. And, yes. and that made me think about the work that you do because many parents can identify with the challenges of managing family and work and kids schedules and meals and home management, the, the physical space. When you are with, when you have ADHD and you have a child with ADHD, staying organized can feel impossible. And where do you start, Wendy? If that is you as a parent. (laughs) Yes. So I'm going to talk about the academic piece as well as in the home, because I didn't get my diagnosis until my son, he's 16 now, but when he wasn't around, I believe it was like first grade, the teacher started saying, I think there's something there. Even in kindergarten, I think there's something there. And as I was filling out the assessment for him, is when I realized, wait a minute, this was me as a child, distracted not being able to focus and and get work done. So the teacher, his first grade teacher, and we actually just went back to Maryland and met her for the first time. And the my son has passed her by probably a, a foot, but it was just amazing. We were able to just thank her because she has ADHD. So she really partnered with us to help him get his diagnosis. And before he even got his diagnosis, she was sending home assignments If there were six math problems on the paper, she was telling us, okay, I want you to cover up five of the problems and only have the one problem that you're working on and just work on that. And that was even before I even started my business. So just her helping us strategize and get the work done, she might might even assign only three problems out of the six. So it wasn't about, oh, the whole page have to be done. It was more of, does he get the concept? And then let's move on. Instead of homework taking four hours a night, it was taking us 30 minutes or maybe 45 minutes. And we were able to get two or three problems done. So the same things when I'm working with clients, you know, um, sometimes the mom, most of the time, the mom is the one that reaches out to me and will say, I need you to work with my child. Maybe they're a teenager. I work, if they have autism, maybe they're 19 to 23 and they need support. And while we're talking, the mom is realizing, wait a minute, this this is me as a child. And they go and they get the bravery to get their diagnosis as well. That helped me get my my diagnosis. So a lot of times when I'm working with, uh, whether it's with a child, maybe the child might be five years old, even if the child is blind or has cerebral palsy, there is still something we can do to give that child that sense of um, accomplishment a sense of responsibility. And then I'm I'm able to partner with the family. So decluttering is not just me and the child. Sometimes you need the whole family to come alongside because it's a family dynamic, not just about the child in a disorganized room. It's bigger than that most of the time. Absolutely. And I hear that from parents as well, like on two points. One is the parent who's sitting there bringing their child to be assessed and then realizing this was me. And then saying to me, do you also assess adults? (laughs) Because they're realizing (laughs) they're seeing some of the same things. 
And when I'm describing how it, you know, ADHD, for example, impacts daily law and person's daily life, they're, they're literally like, that was me as a child. And it still impacts me in a number of ways as an adult. And so you are not alone in having that experience and that aha moment. And I also agree with you that, you know, it's the whole family system often needs to get on board because we know ADHD runs in families. So it's not unusual if you have a child with ADHD to also have a parent who has ADHD, um, even if it's undiagnosed. And so oftentimes the support and the systems that you're putting in place for the child benefit the adults in the home as well, and even siblings. And I always say decluttering is not a one and done. You know, I love when you talk about the minimalism because I don't, I mean, people don't want to say, oh, I'm a minimalist or because people think minimal have being minimal is like you have like one couch, one bed, one outfit. And that's not it at all. Minimalism can just be getting rid of things that no longer fits your life. So when I'm working with clients, sometimes they'll say, I've been following you for a year and now I'm ready because they want to make sure that the person that they bring into their home is not going to judge them. So I always say I am compassionate and non-judgmental. So if I if they book a consultation with me and they say, don't touch my books. Please don't touch my books. I'm not touching your books because if you want to have 500 books in your home, but you were like, I would rather, you know, get rid of all of my clothes. Let's do the kitchen. We focus on that one spot where we can make change. Or sometimes the child might say, I love my stuffed animals or I love my blankets. I remember working with this one adult. Um, He had autism. He was around 19, 20 years old. And he had 10 blankets on his bed because he didn't like the weighted blanket, but he liked the heaviness. So the way how we organized his room and um, instead of the weighted blankets, he had 10 blankets and it was the middle of the summer. This was in Arizona. So he had three on the bed and then we had a basket for his other seven. So my goal was not to declutter his blankets. If he wanted 20 on the bed, that's perfectly fine. He may not need all 20, but we wanted to have it accessible for him because again, he's an adult. We want to make sure he has has a way of getting what he needs, but also making him responsible for his stuff. So that's how I kind of, um, I work with families in that way. the, The idea is not to get rid of your to empty out your home. That is not the goal. That's not my goal. My goal is to work with you. If you want to keep 500 books, let's organize them. Let's make sure they're not covered in dust and you're really using them and create genres. Instead of having 500 books just all over the house, let's get it into a library or a better system, I would say. We know that clutter in our lives can exacerbate behaviors related to ADHD and sensory processing issues. And so decluttering is so important. And even when we make recommendations as psychologists who do these assessments for kids, like you were talking about academics, you know, we're often recommending decluttering the child's workspace and minimizing distractions. That's a form of decluttering because sometimes, you know, we just did an episode prior to this one on task initiation. Sometimes kids can't even get started on their homework or on their assignment because there's too much going on in their space, their sensory overload, or they're distracted by their environment and they can't move forward without that decluttering first. Even the desk space, sometimes there's papers, there's books, there's pencils, there's Kleenex, there's, you know, razor (laughs) chippings, there's, you know, all all the things all over the desk space. And do you tend to start with something like what's a space? I'm, I'm sure it depends on the person in the home and the, the the issues that they're struggling with. But it seems like that's a good place to start for kids is to declutter that workspace. Yes, it's the workspace. So we, we also homeschool our kids. We realized um, when our son gets to high school that it was just a total ball, ball game within the first month, like he was failing all of his classes, his IEP wasn't being implemented, or he was afraid or ashamed to use his IEP. So I was like, you know what, we need to go back to homeschooling. And one of the things that we did was realizing, okay, let's declutter these backpacks. Let's, we are workspace. Sometimes kids sitting at a desk, like I have, I have this hairband. So I have this, if I need it, I'm on the call while I'm working and I can fidget with this. So many times if the kids are in school, they're not able to fidget. Fidgeting is 
is a big no-no. Sit still, you're distracting other people. But a little bit of fidgeting can really help that child stay focused. So sometimes if you realize the child is having a really hard time sitting at a desk doing schoolwork, it is okay for them to sit on the couch or on the back porch or on a swing. Change their environment. And so many times you can see, oh, wow, they really don't want sitting at the desk. But if they're in school and the desk, they have to sit at a desk, try decluttering. Maybe they may have a space underneath the desk um, that they're able to put their stuff and only take out what's currently needed. Um, I know with our daughter, she's nine. And when we go to our co-op, she has um, Pua the pig from Moana. And there were some times where I'm like, Pua is just too big. You can't bring Pua. But our co-op is so, um, so many kids are neurodivergent that she walks in with Pua, big underneath her arms. And, but she's able to focus because for her, Pua is learning. And sometimes if Pua doesn't come, she comes home and she's able to tell Pua exactly what she learned. Because if she's not sitting at, in co-op all day, sad because Pua wasn't able to come. So if there's a toy or something that could come alongside your child, it's so important to allow that because they really can't focus. But those backpacks and the desks, try to make it as minimal as possible. And I'm able to do that. But so many times it start the decluttering starts in their bedrooms. The mom will say, I need them to declutter their bedrooms. And while we're decluttering the bedrooms, we find a backpack, you know, we find... <laughs> lunches that oh my gosh. didn't eat in right. the backpack, you know, and, right. or they will say, you know, the teacher is saying for them to declutter their backpacks and their desk at the co-op is, you know, disorganized. So it flows into other areas of the life. So, so many times decluttering the bedroom is a great place to start, but not always, mm-hmm. not always. So it really depends on the child and on the family, I'm yeah. sure, in terms of what makes sense for the family and what's interfering with getting things done. And then also to let, depends on how old the child is, let them pick out their own stuff. So many times, I know we're um, talking about desks, but sometimes just sitting there undistracted because the shirt that you made them wear has a tag or it's sensory. So also when we're working on the bedrooms, we're working on the closet. Sometimes, Sometimes we start in the closet instead of like under their bed. We start in the closet And I always ask the mom beforehand when we're on the consultation, I said, how involved do you want to be? So if even if the child is five years old and the mama says, I don't care if there's only two items left in their closet and I know they're going to wear it, that's fine. You can get rid of it. And so many times I have the mom look at what was donated to kind of really make sure that it's what the child really wants. But the, the closet is so filled with items that the kids will never wear but the parents is forcing it on the child. So I always say, if you're realizing that you're buying a whole bunch of clothes and the child is wearing that same three shirts, check the texture. It might be a texture thing. And the next time you go shopping, empower the child to go pick out their own clothes because you will see that they really will wear what they pick out versus we're forcing them to wear certain items that's itchy or restrictive. So I start there as well. And that's a great proactive you know, tool is that, you know, in advance you plan to, to collaborate with the child in terms of what it is they're going to wear, because the last thing you want is, you know, a number of pieces of clothing piling up in their bedroom, again, with the tags still on them that they're not going to wear. Right. And then it ends up falling on the ground because the, if the child have um, fine motor skills um, and they're not able to put the items back on the hanger, then it's on the ground. You're thinking it's dirty. You wash it. You put it back in there for them to wear it. They're just not going to wear it. And I always say that we're raising, um, we're raising somebody's husband. We're raising somebody's wife. So yes, we are raising children, but we really want to teach these life skills. And that's how I approach it. These are life skills that the child is going to be 18, 19, 20 and move out. And we want to be able to enable them to go forward and, you know, take care of themselves. We don't want to parent them for the rest of their lives. So I always say start now, even if it's at five years old, give them these small things that they can be empowered to take over. Um, It kind of lessens our burden as well. And we come alongside and partner with them to support them. Absolutely. And it feels also when the family and the parents are involved in their own decluttering, you're modeling that organizational system for your child. You know, I'm a big believer in having a place for everything, having bins and labeling some of those bins. These are Christmas ornaments. So you're not tearing the house apart. 
looking for Christmas ornaments every year, right? Everything has a place. Are there things that you recommend or strategies you recommend for parents for decluttering the home? I know you talked about choosing one place to begin. Are there strategies in terms of organizing things that pile up? <laughs> yes. You know, I was um, I was actually in Costco on um, on Monday and they are selling, even in Target this morning, they are selling these organizational systems like $200, $100. And so many times people think that's what I need to make me organized. Don't buy those things. When I'm working with clients, sometimes they'll say, what do I need to buy before you get here? Do I need to buy bins? Do I need to buy labels and all these things? That doesn't make you organized. Decluttering makes you organized. That is that first level because you can go out and buy a container, but then by the time you declutter, you, you're left with half of what you really need and now the container is too big. So I always say declutter first and then if you want to do bins and labels, I'll leave it as homework because that does not light my soul on fire <laughs> at all. So I will leave that as homework, but the decluttering is what really keeps um, families stuck. So once they declutter and they want to move on to bins and labels, I kind of empower them as homework and they can, you know, show me what they, I can show them tips. I can show them bins and things like that. But honestly, when people buy those container and systems, it ends up just sitting in the corner collecting dust because now they have all these big hopes and dreams for organizing their life. And by the time they just buy that system, now they're overwhelmed and now they're stuck. And they're not able to move forward. Or they say, you know what? I'm going to clean the kitchen and we get this zap of hyper focus, right? Yeah. And they pull everything down. And within two hours, they're like, what did I just do? And now your how your kitchen is a complete mess. So for me, when it comes to systems, yes, if you want to have bins and labels, that's all great. But I really break down, even if it's just a cabinet and there's four shelves, I always say, start with the top shelf, wipe it down, let it dry sort what's in there and then put it back. If you have more energy, great. Let's move to the next shelf. Because even if you run out of steam, you've only have one shelf worth of clutter that's on your cabinet versus trying to do all or nothing. So many times it's an all or nothing thing with neurodivergent brains. So I always try to break it down into small bite-sized pieces. So definitely start with the decluttering and don't worry about the big um, systems that they're selling out there. It, it, Sometimes it makes us feel like we failed when we're not able to implement when we just we're just overwhelmed and we need a smaller strategy to do that. Right. And so what is your definition of decluttering? Because I think some people kind of use decluttering and organization like the bins. That's part of my decluttering. But it sounds like decluttering for you is getting rid of things that no longer serve you. Yes. That's decluttering. And um, and if you want to organize, I always say it's, there's three levels to getting organized. Decluttering, you have to declutter first. Even if it's just going through your closet, maybe you've pared down last month and you say, you know what, I, I feel like I still have too much stuff here. Even if you declutter and you go through your closet one more time and you pull out one to two items, you've decluttered because now you're saying everything in my closet is what I want to keep. Um, if you have 10 loads of laundry to do, and your family is not walking around naked, it's time to declutter your clothes because then it's too much. It's not, it's gotten out of hand. It's gotten out of control. So I would say start with decluttering your clothes because if you still have clothes in the closet, that has meant that you're never going to wear it. You're waiting for the load of laundry to be done so you can put back on those same clothes <laughs> because <laughs> right. those are your favorites. Right. Yeah, so I always say declutter and then you start organizing. So you declutter what you have you start saying, okay, here's where all my shirts are going to go. Here's where all the, you know, pants and everything is going to go. And then the next step would be, okay, let me get that container to put it in with labels and, and all those things. But just having your stuff on the shelf, even if it's not in a container, it's organized. Right. And if, if there's a really good feeling associated with post decluttering. You know, it's just like, especially if you think about your kitchen and you find spices that have probably been there for years that, you yeah. know, they're sitting in the back of the, of the cabinet. And, yeah. you know, why is this still here? Right. Yeah. And then so many times you declare the pantry and realize I have five bags of rice because they're on different shelves. They're tucked in the back. Right. And now just combining those five of 
five bags of rice on one shelf, maybe you have a bakery shelf, you have a carb shelf, you're organized. You know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't, it's not just because it's not in a, a pretty bin with labels doesn't mean that you're not organized. And I think we need to change the definition of what organizing means and what decluttering means. It's not getting rid of everything. It's just getting rid of those things that no longer serve you. So if you need five bags of rice because you have a large family, then, you know, you're not over, you're not over hoarding, you're not over keeping of things. That's how much you need for your family. Right. And don't look at other families too and say, well, oh my gosh, they have white couches and their house is immaculate. Well, they probably don't have children because <laughs> I would love to know families that have white couches with children <laughs> or, you know, maybe their kids are older or they don't, you know what I mean? So I always say no two homes are the same. So when I'm implementing strategies with family, I'm only looking at this family and their family and their needs. So if I'm working with a family um, that has cerebral palsy, I'm looking at tripping hazards as well as decluttering. Or, you know, if um, you may have, I worked with one family, um, the 11 year old boy had cerebral palsy, but she also had a little child, maybe three or four years old. So when we're looking at the walk-in pantry, we're putting his things on the first level, but high enough that the three-year-old can't get to it. You know, so whereas he's not up on his crutches trying to get something in the pantry that can cause a tripping hazard. So I'm looking at the whole family, not just, I'm not, everybody is not, all families are not the same. So I always look at their dynamic and what they need as we are decluttering. Right. And that, I love the, that, that tactic and that strategy, you know, because again, it's, it's about being things being accessible, right. And being able to get them when you need them. And even when you talked about the example of the the bags of rice, you can have five bags of rice, but if you don't know where they are, then that's the problem. It's the problem is that I don't know where my rice is. And now I'm going to the grocery store to get more, not realizing that I have those five bags in the pantry because I can't find them in there. And I have found that when I'm organized, my brain is much more clear and I'm able to function better. Sometimes I can't even, like I talked about task initiation, get started unless things are out of my way, you know? Right. And there's some, so many times it's like we have like on our computer, we have like 50 tabs open and sometimes it's just making a list and closing those tabs, you know, or, you know, having a folder that says, you know, my brain dump and just putting those tabs in there so you can kind of clean up your desk space so you can start fresh. Even if you might reopen half of those tabs again, it's still okay to, you know, just close those tabs, even if you're going to bed. And and that's my goal is trying to close up, close down my computer every single night. So the tabs in my brain are closed. Yes. Because then we're always thinking about something. And I'm glad you mentioned that brain dump because so many kids and adults struggle to organize their own brain space. There's just so much in there that they, and they need to unload a lot of it, particularly if those kids, those adults even have working memory issues, which we know is common in, in individuals with ADHD. There's only so much space in your working memory system. And if you're trying to hold too many things in there, like too many tabs open, you're going to start forgetting. So decluttering the mind, and you used an example of, you know, writing things down rather than having all those tabs open is so important. And it's not just, you know, it's not just the tabs too. It's all the different hats that we're wearing. Because sometimes you can have 50 tabs, one's grocery shopping, one's the school list, one's something for your business, one's this. So sometimes it's just closing off those tabs, but then also um, compartmentalizing yes. business, family, kids, you know, co-op, homeschool, all these different tabs and folders right. that we have yes. open in the brain as well. Absolutely. So it's prioritizing, you know, after you're kind of decluttering, I'm thinking about all of that, the cognitive decluttering is prioritizing part of that. I know you mentioned like writing it down. So making lists, it seems would be part of that, maybe even using technology reminders. So you don't have to rely on holding all of those instructions and those things you have to do, those to-do lists in your working memory. And then prior, and then prioritizing, okay, what needs to be first? My kids know 
if it's not on the calendar, it's not going to happen. So I have a paper calendar and I have a Google calendar for the family. So I, I mean, I have something on the calendar. My husband gets a notif- he gets an invite. My son gets an invite. He's 16 now. So even though we homeschool, he works at Chick-fil-A. So he knows where we are, my nine-year-old, because I always say my whole family, we're neurodivergent. And I always say I'm the most functioning <laughs> So I have to keep all the trains running on track. Everybody knows where everybody is. But my daughter knows, like, if we're scheduling a play date, she was like, okay, put on the calendar now. I'm like, yeah, yeah, in a minute. She's like, no, because if you don't put on the calendar, it's not going to happen. So I need you to stop and put on the calendar. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> put it on the calendar. Yes. yes. I say that to my husband the whole this, all the time. It's like, is it on the calendar? You know, he takes the kids <laughs> and he takes the kids to get their dentist appointment and the dentist gives him yes. the follow up time. If it's not on yes. the calendar, I'm not going to know about it. You know, one of the things that I do with doctor's appointments that my daughter, she has braces. So when we leave that session, before I leave, I book the next session and I'm there on my phone and they're like, do you need a paper thing? No, no, no. I do not need a paper reminder. I'm putting it <laughs> on my calendar right now. Right. You know, so if you're going for a haircut, before you leave the barber chair, book the next session, you know? So that's how we do it as, as much as we can. The annual physical, sometimes they don't book a year out, but make put something on your calendar saying maybe six months out, book your, you know, book your, um, your, your annual physical. So always have something on the calendar with reminders to really help us as well. Yes, because even after you do the brain dump, you know, of all the things that need to be done, then you have to figure out, the order to do them in and prioritizing, like you're saying, and when do you need to do them? So having it on the calendar, book your annual, book your kids follow up, remember to re-register them for soccer, all of that is on the calendar. So you're not having to, again, hold all of that in. Yeah. And then show the kids how you're doing it also. So you're also teaching them okay, if it's on the calendar, it's not going to happen. Maybe you have a teenager who who is in soccer and doing all these things and realizing don't have four and five different calendars. Have one yes. calendar <laughs> because you're the only person. So you have one life, one calendar, and everything flows to it. So just kind of helping them think about long-term as an adult. Here's how, here's a strategy that you can implement. Yes. And I love what you said about having the digital calendar, because I use Google Calendar, but also having the physical calendar because we have one on our refrigerator. So I know, yes. you know, when is pizza pizza Tuesdays, you know, for the kids. I don't know. I know that I don't have to make a lunch, but this week I made lunch on Pizza Tuesday and I'm unpacking the lunches and I'm like, why did you eat lunch? And they're like, it's Pizza Day. Pizza Tuesday, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And then sometimes writing things down helps you remember also. Yeah, so Post- Post-its strategy. are my friend. You know, if I, yes. put, if I put a Post-it near the lunch bags then I would have remembered. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and you know, one thing that I do when it comes to um, the decluttering is helping those kids identify and even... As I love checklists. For me, I like when you make that brain dump, have like little squares next to it. Even if you did something and you forgot to do it, put on the list and check it off. <laughs> <That's what laughs> There's satisfaction That's in that strategy. in that check mark. Yes. 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 <laughs> and that helps the kids too. If we've decluttered their bedroom and we come and you know, they're maintaining their room, they have a checklist. Okay. Is my bed, is there clothes in the bed? Check underneath the bed. Check the closet. Is there clothes in the closet that I no longer want to do? Check your toy. If you have a toy room or you have a toy area in your room, check there. Are there toys that's broken? So they can always go back and check off those spaces and kind of reset their rooms or reset their other spaces. That's a great way to help them as well. Wonderful. Now, Wendy, this this time has gone by so quickly and this has been <laughs> such a great conversation. I feel like I could talk to you for another 30 minutes. But yes. any final words or suggestions for parents who may feel overwhelmed by the clutter in their lives, in their family's life? Yes, I would say don't stay stuck. So many times people are ashamed. Um, there's clients that have reached out to me for consultations and said, Wendy, um, are you sure you want to come? Like this session would be like tomorrow. And they would send me a text saying, are you sure you want to come? It's pretty bad. You know, so just make sure if you're reaching out to someone for help, make sure that that person is compassionate and non-judgmental. If, if you sense any whiff of 
judgmental, um, if they're being judgmental, do not go with that person. Book a consultation with them, show up on Zoom, let them see your spaces. Um, and if you're not ready, it's okay, but don't stay in shame. Don't, you know, don't stay stuck. Reach out for support. Um, for me, um, I have free 20 minute consultations. We jump on Zoom. I am here in Florida, in Jacksonville, Florida, and I travel. We just moved from Arizona and I also um, serve clients in Maryland as well. But I also have an online community. Um, I have a membership for um, special needs community. Um, and we would love to have you in there um, if you're not able to, or maybe you're not comfortable having somebody come into your home right away. There is support for you as well. But book that consultation and just really let them know what's happening. Maybe you may suspect that you have special needs. Your child may have special needs, your spouse, and just let, really let them know. And um, I hope that you get the support that you need because it's, it's really needed. And in 2023, let's reclaim our homes and our lives. Yes. Now, if listeners want to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to connect with you, Wendy? Yes. So my website is yourdeclarecoach.com. And then also, if you want to know more about my membership and um, maybe join a free co-working session once a week, we jump on Zoom um, because I have found that a lot of my clients, they, they may go out and buy courses or they'll you know, buy all the things, right? They search on Pinterest and they realize I'm not able to implement these things. I'm a take action person. So we jump on Zoom 90 minutes every single week. And I always ask, what are you working on today? People are working, some people just sit there and fold their laundry uh, because it's such a, um, it's painful for them to do on their own. So we all jump on Zoom. Everybody's working on different things for 90 minutes. And I have a free trial on there. So it's yourdeclarecoach.com slash trial. And you can try out a, um, a 90 minute co-working session with us. Wonderful. And I will be sure to put links in the show notes for those of you listening and who want to connect with Wendy. Wendy, thank you so much for joining me here today. It's been a great conversation. Yes, it has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Wendy. If you want more information from her about how to declutter and create systems in your home, make sure you reach out to her directly. Her information is in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. For more resources, visit us online at childnexus.com.